I guess that's a well-tempered clavier. It's the first of the preludes. Um, the well-tempered clavier, let's give it its full title. Um, we can all read that. The well-tempered clavier, or preludes and fugues on every tone and semitone, in major as well as minor, for the use and profit of young musicians anxious to learn, and as a pastime for others already expert in the art, composed and prepared by Johann Sebastian Bach, at present Kapellmeister and Director of Chamber Music at the Princely Court of Unhard Curtain in the year 1722. <laughs> Catchy, right? So, Every tone and semitone, there's 12 keys in the octave, and each key appears in both major and minor, as he says. So that's 24 preludes and fugues. They go on. And so on. But why? <laughs> well, if you've ever studied any music or hung out with anyone who has, you've probably heard that Bach was proving a point, that if you tuned your keyboard the way he tuned his keyboard, it was possible to play music in all keys without having to retune the instrument between the pieces. Now, this doesn't seem particularly special these days, um, particularly for pianists like me. We take for granted that we can just sit down anywhere and start playing any music we want, assuming, of course, the instrument's in tune. But what does that even mean, to be in tune? What does Bach mean by well-tempered, or what is temperament? So let's move from music to some science. science. Um, sound. Sound is how we perceive vibrations in the air. Um, we make these vibrations by passing air past vocal cords or by uh, making an electromagnet vibrate some cones in a loudspeaker or by plucking a string. I brought a string here. Um, when vibrations travel, they make pressure waves. We call them sound waves. And pitch is the word that we use to describe how we perceive the frequency of the wave. The shorter the string that I play, which I adjust moving my finger on the fretboard, the shorter the wavelength, the higher the frequency, right? So let's give the notes of the scale names. We can use letters or other syllables. It doesn't really matter. The important thing is that they have names because now we're going to define an interval, which we use do by counting the number of names between the notes. Um, but we include the notes on either side. It's a bit confusing. So this is a third. One, two, three, a third. This is a fourth. We've been naming the intervals like this since the ancient Greeks. Pythagoras, in particular, was interested in what makes some intervals sound good <laughs> and some not. I, I want to hear that. I want to hear that again before the night's out. Um, and he worked out that it all had to do with the ratios of the wavelengths. So let's replicate some of these experiments. Um, let's play a note. To go up an octave, we halve the string. So we kind of hear the same note, just higher. That's a two to one ratio of wavelength. So the uh, second line and the first line up there is that ratio. If we want to make a fifth, we go up a third of the way. So it leaves two thirds of the string vibrating. So a ratio of two to three. That's the second to the third line. A fourth is a three to four ratio and so on. So I'm cheating a little because uh, this is a fretboard. It has frets on exactly the right spots. Um, Pythagoras obviously did this without any of frets and just listened to all the sounds. But he concluded that if the wavelengths were in integer ratios, they're pleasant to listen to. We call them in tune. So let's use this to tune the keyboard. To tune the whole scale, we need to find a pitch for all the notes, not just like the intervals that we had. Now, the nice thing about fifth is, in theory, we can just keep stacking fifths. We go up and up and up, and once we've gone through 12 of them, we're back where we started, right? So. There we go, 12 of them. But 
We're not actually back where we started. This is where we started. This is where we ended up. We're high by about a quarter of a semitone. And the reason for this is that math. Bear, bear with me, two and three are prime numbers, so there's no power of two that is also a power of three. You can't do it. The closest you can get is this. And we're off by about a quarter of a semitone, which is an interval we call the Pythagorean comma. <laughs> Thank you. So, what do you do? How do you deal with this? Well, you can ignore it. You can just put this comma, like, somewhere you aren't going to find it. So. Let's dial it around a bit. There we go. Um, and so you've got a bad interval here. But let's just compose music that doesn't use that interval. And then everything else sounds lovely. But that's not the only interval that doesn't sound so great. It turns out that thirds that we get if we stack fifths like this are also far too wide. It sounds really off, so we need to do better. So let's adjust some of the notes a little bit out of tune to make them all fit in a way so that the intervals we want sound nice. We call this adjustment tempering, and the resulting tuning is a temperament. Here's one. Um, this one fixes the problem with the thirds. Specifically, it's called quarter comma mean tone, which means we shrink all the fifths by a quarter of that comma, the Pythagorean comma. We call it the syntonic comma, this smaller one. And now when we stack them, the third that we get is perfectly pure. And so now we can play thirds that sound nice and chords. This particular temperament was very popular, particularly among organists, right up until the 20th century. But it also has a big problem. You'll have noticed on the slide, we have pure thirds, it's beautiful, but there's still a gap. And it turns out that we also can't stack pure thirds to make an octave. There just aren't multiples that work. So we still need to pick an interval that is off, and we still need to kind of avoid those keys. There's a story that the uh, famous organ builder, Gottfried Silbermann, um, presented one of his organs to Bach once, was hoping to impress the composer, um, and Bach replied, you tune the organ in the manner you please, and I'll play the organ in the key I please, and sat down to play. Eventually, Silbermann had to leave the room, unable to bear the out-of-tune chords. But there's another way to do this. Let's just give up on the idea of perfect intervals entirely and divide the octave into 12 parts. So the ratio between two adjacent notes is the 12th root of two. This way, every interval is off by a little, but it's always the same amount, no matter where in the scale the interval appears. This is called equal temperament. Equal temperament has a certain symmetrical appeal, and increasingly complex harmonies and progressions really depend on this uniformity. So in equal temperament, you can do things like this. But to musicians that are used to pure intervals, the tempering is noticeably too much. The fifth is slightly too small, and the third is really far too wide. Now, I'm not expecting anyone here to actually here, that is far too wide. And the reason is as follows. Here's a quote from the 1890 edition of the Grove Dictionary of Music. By constantly listening to the equally tempered scale, the ear may be brought not only to tolerate its intervals, but to prefer them. And this is, in fact, what's happened. Equal temperament is so prevalent that our modern ears have simply accepted it. It's what we expect to hear everywhere, even in music that is really supposed to be medieval, right? <laughs> But the price we pay for the symmetry and flexibility of equal temperament is that, other than the octave, none of the intervals are actually in tune. And lots of people had, in, um, lots of people had opinions on this. 
George Bernard Shaw, for instance, describing a performance by the famed Hungarian violinist Josef Joachim, the notes which were musical enough to have any discernible pitch at all were mostly out of tune. <laughs> Descartes argued with his friends in letters, saying, as for the reasons given by your musicians, I find them so absurd that I hardly more know how to reply. Um, and not mincing words, here's Robert Smith, mathematician, music theorist, and master of Trinity College, Cambridge, in the 18th century. The harmony is extremely coarse and disagreeable. Which brings us back to Bach and his well-tempered clavier. Clearly, everyone had opinions. Bach did, too. But if Silbermann's mean tone tuning wasn't what Bach preferred, what then? Well, obviously equal temperament, right? But not so fast. Bach wrote well-tempered, not equal-tempered, and there's good reason to doubt that equal temperament was what he meant. It turns out there's a bunch of other temperaments that work well in all keys, just not equally. These are called circular temperaments, and they give each key a different character, which would be a good reason to write a piece of music in all the different keys, if you think about it. Here's one from a book of them, yes, a collection of them, by a contemporary of Bach's, organist Andreas Werkmeister. It sounds like this. of people are pretty sure this is the temperament that Bach used on his own instruments. But there's also some evidence that Bach made up his own temperament. A number of musicologists claim that Bach even put a temperament on the title page of the first edition of the Well-Tempered Clavier. Can you spot it? <laughs> That's right, it's the swells at the top. Now, obviously people disagree on exactly how to read the swells. Um, <laughs> and there's, there's a bunch of musicologists who have difficulty taking any of this seriously. But regardless of what specific temperament Bach meant, the fact that he's proving it with preludes and fugues in all 24 keys shows it's clearly a circular, but probably unequal temperament like the Werkmeister. So that's a whole lot of science, math, conjecture, and opinions. <laughs> what am I taking away from all this? Well, for one thing, I, I feel I owe you an apology for making you listen to that A-flat prelude um, in the mean tone temperament. So he here it is in one of those temperaments derived from the swirls on the title page. And sometimes, sometimes I feel all this shows that near enough really is good enough, and being slightly wrong is maybe more right than anything else. <laughs> and mostly, let's appreciate and raise our glasses in a minute to all those who, while everyone else is loudly arguing about how and why something can't be done, like Bach, just go ahead and do it anyway. Cheers. <laughs>